So here these last three or four weeks, we have continued to talk about taking things back to basics. And while it was, it was never in my head as a series from the get-go that we were just going to keep going with, that is, that is the direction that God has continued to go, to, to go the, what he's just continued to do and to lay on my heart. So we're going to continue with taking it back to basics. Today's sermon is, and again, these are all things that you can see plastered on any kindergarten classroom ever. Actions speak louder than words. We've all heard that, right? We all know that to be true. Let me ask someone a question. Who do I want to ask? Marcy. If you had, if right now, like the church was doing a giveaway, this would be epic. If we were doing a giveaway, giveaway and we gave you $604,800, would you be excited? Would you be amped up? Would you be upset if Gene came up and said, hey, can I borrow 15 bucks after you won the $604,800? No, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be upset with him. Would you harbor any resentment towards him for asking? Would you want to physically assault him for asking? A week later, would you go up and remind him about that $15? You wouldn't? Okay. 604,800 sounds like a pretty specific number, right? There are 604,800 seconds in a week. How many of them do we waste? See, we, we weren't talking about dollars. We were talking about seconds. And when we talk about anger or resentment or bringing it back up, what we're really talking about is those wasted seconds that we feel someone took from us. If you have 604,800 seconds in a week and someone, and this happens, someone wastes two minutes of your life. You know you're never getting it back, but is it worth it to waste any more of those 604,800 seconds on being angry, on hating, on the things that go on in our heads when we get upset? Is it worth it, is it, worth it to waste some of those seconds that we get next week? Like I said, are you, are you going to remind Gene of it the next week? We do that all the time. We are going to talk about redemption here in a minute, but this is something that God put on my heart in the middle of this week. Redemption and forgiveness go hand in hand a lot, right? And, and this morning we're talking about not necessarily wasting our time, at least for this, this short period. How many of us say that we forgive somebody? We say that we gave it to God, but the very next time that particular person hurts us, what happens? Every bit of it floods right back. So have we truly forgiven? Have we truly put it under the blood? Because if we do, we're done bringing it up. We're done holding it against people. That, that one was just... a like a nanosecond of a conversation that just went through my head all week. Now we can, we can continue with the sermon. There are many, many uses or translation for the word redemption or redeem in the Bible. More than I'm going to talk about this morning, look that up. But we are going to talk about three specific ones this morning. So one of the first translations or uses for the word redeem or redemption is to buy or purchase. That makes sense, right? We redeem stuff all the time. In this sense, 
and, and I know that we all know this, Christ redeemed us. But there's a, an implication of ownership there. Christ redeemed us, just not, not to redeem us, he redeemed us so that we could be his, so that we could fall under his lordship and experience all that he has for us. Another translation of redemption is that, that we are, our life is this. Let's just say whatever this is. Usually, you know, not so great. We're, we're not necessarily walking where we should be walking, how we should be walking, talking how we should be talking, doing the things that we should be doing. And God comes in and redeems us. And now we have a different purpose, right? Now we have a different walk, a different path. So that is the second translation of redemption that we're going to talk about this morning. He redeems us and sets us for a new purpose. Because the majority of us, before we met Christ, did not have the purpose that we now serve. And of course... We, we, we can't talk about redemption without saying Jesus came and paid our debt. He redeemed us. That's the most important translation, use, however you want to articulate it. Jesus Christ came and redeemed each and every person that walks this earth. And from what? What do you, what do you save us from? What was the redemption for? Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, and the gift of eternal life from Christ Jesus our Lord. So we know that without redemption, what, what, is, what is our path, our purpose, our sin, our debt, where does that send us? To hell. But through his redemption, through his redemption, the Bible is, is a book of redemption. I mean, the, the Bible is a book of many, many, many things. But it's also a book of redemption. God tells us multiple accounts of redemption through his word. We all know the story of Noah, right? The story of Noah, I mean, we, we probably heard about it in Sunday school. If you didn't hear about it in Sunday school, you heard somebody who was in Sunday school talk about it. We've all, we've all heard. We all have heard the redemption story of Noah. But just in case, God warned the world at that time about a worldwide judgment that was coming. We understand that, right? It wasn't like just Noah's community. It was everybody. And Noah was, was given the assignment to go preach. Go warn everybody. Give them my warning. Have them to heed this warning. And how long did he do it? How long did Noah spread that message? 120 years Noah went around faithfully telling people, as many people as he could, and asking them to spread the word. We're going to be judged. Heed this warning. Come get on the boat. He faithfully did that for 120 years. And, and what a waste. The only people that got on the boat were Noah and his family, and of, of course the animals. But think about that for a second. Does that seem like a waste? We're looking at eight people-ish. Worldwide judgment. Was there more room on the ark? Or did Noah have to say, yeah, hey, we're at max capacity. The fire marshal's going to come in any second. You can't get on. Room of plenty. Room of plenty. 
Does that seem sad? How many of us miss the boat of redemption each and every day? It is, it's no different. They were offered redemption. Each and every day, we are offered the same redemption to live in that redemption. The people of Noah's times were not the only one who missed the boat of redemption. It is, it's the same now as it was when Noah was preaching it. Redemption is offered to all. And if we are just willing to repent and believe, that's, that's all. It doesn't, there's not a list of prerequisites. There's not anything that says, you know, accomplish A, B, and C, and bam, you got it. It is simply us receiving, believing, being willing to let him in and receive what he has got for us. Sadly, sadly, just as in Noah's time, very few receive it. And even sadder, very few of us live in it. It's one thing not to receive it. It's another thing to receive it and then not allow the change that comes with it. If you've got your Bibles, let's look in Jeremiah chapter 18. If you don't have your Bibles, we've got Bibles, but otherwise we've, we'll have words up here. Jeremiah 18. We're just going to read six verses, one through six. The potter and the clay, this is the, the second account of redemption that we're going to look at and study this morning. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand. O house of Israel. So let's sum this up real quick. Jeremiah was a prophet, right? You got a lot to live up there to, baby Dewey. Jeremiah. So Jeremiah was a prophet. He was, and he was told to, to go to the potter's house. Watch what he's doing for a little bit. Once you've watched for a little bit and you're paying attention, I'll get back with you. We'll continue this conversation here in just a minute. We, we, we can read this story and, and see what Jeremiah saw, right? Right? So he goes to the potter's house. He sees the potter working. And that very first pot, you know, maybe, maybe it wasn't so great. Maybe, maybe he saw something in it that, that needed refined. And maybe he saw something in it that, that would be okay for now, but in the future may end up causing some issue, weaken it a little bit may form into a crack. So, you know, he, he, took, he took it down to the beginning again, redid it, remade it, made it better than it was before. It's the same piece of clay, right? It doesn't say that the potter scrapped it, threw it away. It just says that he, he took it back down to build it back up. 
and make it better. God is the potter and we are the clay. We all know that. God loves us enough to not just scrap us, but to reshape us, to remold us, and to create something beautiful out of all that's here. Not to scrap anything, not to get rid of it, but just taking whatever broken pieces there may be, to take whatever we may look at as insignificant, broken, useless, worthless, He can take it. Throw some love in Jesus in it and make it better. 2 Corinthians 5.17, I realize it's, I probably use this verse at least once every two months. I cannot help it. I love it. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. How many of us in here have ever been in a place in our lives where we needed the potter to do some remolding, to do some remodeling, to take things like we've been talking about for four weeks now, to take things back to basics and and let us start fresh. Take us back to the beginning. Make us new. And each and every one in here have the opportunity to be that new creation. God loves us enough to work on us, to fix us, to forgive us, and as we're talking about this morning, to redeem us. Is is that good news to anybody? He loved us enough to redeem us. We deserve death. We deserve eternity. We're not even going to speak to it. We don't deserve the eternity we get after redemption. But he gave it to us anyway. He loved us enough to do that. If he loved us enough to redeem us, why do we not love him enough to live redeemed? If we don't live redeemed, people will never want to know our Redeemer. That goes hand in hand. You cannot impress people with Jesus and yourself at the same time. It is one or the other. And I can tell you from personal experience, I'm just not too awful impressive at all. But if I can stand on a corner and talk about Jesus and all that he's done, how much he loves us, what his presence has done in my life, in my personal story of redemption, and the story of redemption that he gave to all, well, that's impressive. His story is impressive. But here's the thing. If I go and I try to speak that message... And, I, and, and I'm not trying to impress people with myself. I'm not living for myself. I am living for Jesus. I am proclaiming Jesus. I'm telling his story and not mine. You cannot separate the man from the message. You cannot do it. If you proclaim a certain message, but you live a different message, and, and that's why... We're, we're titling today's sermon, Actions Speak Louder Than Words. Our actions may completely toss aside the message that we proclaim. You cannot separate a man from his message. If this is my message, but I live this message, which one are you going to believe? Are, are we going to believe that I'm redeemed if I'm still living like hell? No. He gave us redemption, and he gave it to us with a purpose. As we mentioned earlier, we all had a previous purpose. We didn't have a calling on our lives, but it's different than where we're at now, right? 
Let's look at redemption one more time. Let's look at Luke 15, 4 through 7. Luke 15, 4 through 7. I figured I would mention this later in the message because if I mention it at the beginning, it usually doesn't go that way. Today's message may be a bit, little bit shorter than usual. I figured I'd save it till I got to the last page because Ben gives me a hard time. I say, we're going to have a short message today, and I walk over there, and he's like, yeah, 38 minutes. Sorry. So, Luke 15, 4 through 7. And right now, Jesus is speaking to tax collectors, sinners, Pharisees, scribes. This is who Jesus is talking to. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. We'll sum this story up too. We will exhort from what Jesus said and, and figure this thing out, which, which I'm sure many of us have. When all the uppity religious folks, what were they doing the, the, in the prefix of this story? What were they doing? They were running their mouths because of who Jesus was hanging out with. So when they were running their mouth about who Jesus was hanging out with, the sinners, the uncool kids, the undesirable crowd, the losers, Jesus, what, what's he do? Gives them a story of redemption. Leaves the 99 to go after the one. And not just to go after the one, but to redeem the one. And in, in this account, in, in the parable that Jesus was using, what he was throwing in the face of the religious folks was exactly what our church and every church around the world needs to hear today. The lost sheep, the one, the one he was after to redeem, that is sinners. They need to be found. There is rejoicing in heaven over every lost sheep, lost person, sinner, who receives salvation or who returns to the Father. Was it last week or the week before we talked about the prodigal son? Heaven rejoices not just when someone returns to the Father, but comes to the Father for the first time. Redemption. But it, it is more important, and I realize this, this part may get kind of confusing, so I'm going to say it nice and slow. It is more important for the church to operate as the church when they're not at church. We, we act like the church, the majority of us, we act like the church on Sunday from 9 to noon, and then on Sunday from 5 to 7, 7.30, depending on how late we go. And by George, we act like the church on Wednesday from about 5 to 8.30. But it is more important that the church operate as the church when they're not at the church, when we're not here, when we're not together doing churchy things. 
Because the law, here's right here, each one of these buildings, people have the opportunity to meet, to be encouraged, to be lifted up, to be edified, to experience Christian fellowship. To receive prayer. To be filled up. But the lost are out there. We know that, right? I mean, I realize we we stray from the narrow path from time to time. But this building... we, We need to realize that it is not just a place... For those who are saved, to come be filled up, to come be restored, to learn a little bit, to gain some wisdom and insight into what God has for us. If we, and I'm not talking about growth, I'm not talking about numbers, there is not one single solitary time, I promise you, moving forward where I will personally feel like a failure because we're not busting at the seams. I do not care. If God has one person in here on Sunday morning, by George, that might be the one person who can change a ton, who receives that redemption, who lives in that redemption, and goes and plants 17 churches. That might happen. So I am not concerned with the amount of people that are in here at any given time. But we had better start inviting the lost to church because We come in here to be filled by Jesus, right? They need to come in here so they can know him at all. Why why are we, and and I'm I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. I don't want anyone looking at anybody else. Just keep this to yourself. Every, and I'll, I'll speak for you on the first one, every single one of us knows somebody who's lost. And more than likely, most of us have talked to somebody who is lost about being lost. But have we told them to come where we go to get filled up, to receive? I promise you, before I started standing on this stage and talking to you on Sunday mornings, I had multiple jobs where I would work graveyard, couldn't make it on certain Sundays, And I promise you, I got weak. It was easier and easier and easier for the enemy to attack me. To defeat me. To lie to me. I I come to this place and bam, right then and there, I feel stronger. I feel more courageous because of what Jesus has done. And sometimes I just need to be reminded of that. Sometimes I need my brothers and sisters, to lay their hands on me. Lift me up. Build me up. If a person who misses one or two Sundays a month here and there needs to be restored, needs to know, needs to be edified, needs to be built up, how much more does a lost person who has never had some Jesus Christ need it? Where are they? They're not here. They're out there. If we don't start getting some lost people in the doors of this church, I promise we'll start having church in the parking lot so they can at least drive by and maybe catch something. And if we can't do it there, then we'll just start having church in communities. We will go, bam, to just to a random spot. We will invade the darkness with the light if that's what it takes. We are coming to a critical critical moment in time not in our time not in earthly time we are coming upon critical times for the kingdom those people that we know that are lost that we occasionally talk to I do not want to see them burning for eternity because we, because we didn't invite them, we didn't talk to them about Jesus, we didn't tell them the story of redemption, we didn't live redeemed so they could believe the Redeemer.
I, uh, I will be the first to admit I occasionally have trouble living redeemed. There are a lot of times where I need God to take me back, remold me, reshape me, remind me of that purpose, light that fire again. I need that. We, and, I, and I've been talking about this for a few weeks now, but if we are not living that life, where is the desire for the lost person to live a life that looks just like theirs? I, I, I wouldn't want that. Hey, we've, we've got to live redeemed if we want people to want to know our Redeemer. We've talked about this before, and that's why this message is titled what it is. Actions speak louder than words. We have many evangelists in this room. Most of all, probably like Brother Matt. Every, just like three hands got pointed at Matt. Matt is that dude who does not mind this right here. I say because I don't have time to encompass everything that may or may not be said. But we, we have people who have the, the gift of evangelism, and they obediently and faithfully walk in that. But when I say faithfully and obediently walk, that's the most important part right there because each and every one of you is an evangelist with the way that you walk, with the way that you operate day in and day out in your life. And whether you realize it, you're, you're living out a message, and you cannot separate the message from the man. So if the words coming out of your mouth don't match the action in the message that you tell with your actions, quit lying. Actions speak louder than words.